Welcome, you're watching another great episode right here on IT Pro TV. Right now, we're taking a look at CompTIA's IT Fundamentals for Exam FC0U61. I'm your host, Ronnie Wong, and today we're going to be diving into well, more operating systems, and we're specifically taking a look at GNU Linux. And here to help us, of course, well, is uh, Mr. Linus Torvald's uh, adopted son himself. <laughs> Don, what's that? Don, how are you doing? <laughs> I am doing great, Ronnie. Uh, ready to jump in and, and talk about uh, Linux. Uh, <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good good setup for me here. Um, so we are going to be talking about the Linux operating system, which is a very misunderstood operating system for a lot of people, especially if you're new to computers or just getting into IT, because Linux has a, a pretty interesting history. It is primarily a server-based operating system. So you'll see it used in tons of website and internet infrastructure that's out there, but it is also a desktop operating system, which means you may be running it on your laptop or desktop right now. Odds are you aren't, actually a very, very small market share uh, in the desktop side. So a lot of us haven't been exposed to it, but when you jump into the server world, Linux actually has the majority of the market share. And so it is a, a very heavily deployed operating system. It is a lot different than the other OSs we've talked about that are owned by corporations. You have the Microsoft Windows and the Apple uh, Mac OS. Here you have GNU Linux, which is an open operating system that is free, that anybody can download and create and modify and, and just have ultimate access to it, which is partly why it's been so successful in the server world. So in this episode, we're going to take a look at Linux, how it functions, what it does, what kind of makes it different than the other OSs that are out there, and just kind of get our get our feet wet with an operating system that we don't normally get exposed to. All right, Don, now I've previously alluded to this in my intro of you uh, here. Can you tell us a little bit more about the history? I, I do understand that it is from a guy that uh, his name is Linus Torvalds, uh, but can you share a little bit and uh, bring us up to date on where we are today? All right, so Linux, it, it's been around a while, right? Uh, it, it actually was released in, I believe, 1991 or 1992, the early 1990s. And basically, it's the product of a, of a hobbyist, right? There was a, a university student at a, a university in, she was in Norway yeah. or Finland. It was in a, you know, one of the Nordic <laughs> Shield countries. Uh, but it was a gentleman named Linus Torvalds. And he was at a university where he was working on a mainframe system that ran the Minix operating system that was, that was based on Unix, right? So Unix was an operating system that came out of AT&T laboratories in the 1970s. It was designed as a programmers operating system and it was designed for systems that were way too expensive and complex for any normal person to have so you only had access to them when you were work for, working for large corporations or when you were at universities well Linus he was at a university and he was working on these systems and he said wouldn't it be nice if at the end of the day I could go home and I could use a system that was similar that was compatible with what I was using at the university but I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest in infrastructure like the university does, what could I create on my own? And so he launched the idea of Linux. It came from this one person, Linus Torvalds, and he said, I'm going to create an operating system that is compatible with these bigger systems that are all based on Unix. So it is a Unix-like operating system. And he just took his name, Linus, and combined it with Unix to create the Linux name that, that we have for the operating system today. Now, one man can only create so much. And what Linus actually created was what was called a kernel. And we've talked about the kernel in other episodes. That's the heart and soul of an operating system. It's that piece that's controlling all of the interaction between the software and the hardware and, and all of that. So a very, very critical piece. But that's what he made, just that one little piece. And in the beginning, that kernel, it was less than a megabyte in size. In fact, most people's kernels today are still less than a megabyte in size. Is not a huge amount of, of construction in there. But by itself, a kernel is practically useless. I mean, it's the heart <laughs> and the soul, but without everything that goes around it. I imagine uh, as a human being, what would you be if you were just your heart? Right. It's, it's no good. You need everything else. You need lungs and a brain and, and all the other components in order to actually be functional. If you were just a heart, it would, well, first off, it'd be really gross. But second, <laughs> I mean, it would just sit there and beat, I guess. But <laughs> so, so that's how the kernel is inside of Linux. It's got to be surrounded by other things. It's got to be surrounded by a graphical user interface. It's got to be surrounded by a command line interface and, and commands, the actual tools that we run. Well, Linux 
uh, Linus didn't create all of that. Instead, his kernel gets packaged with a number of other tool sets to create what we generally refer to as Linux. And the most popular tool set is one called the GNU Tools. And the GNU Tools are free and open source tools that provide you with things like uh, a bash command line interface and other tools that are available to be able to function. It's all from several different projects. So unlike Microsoft Windows, when the entire operating system comes from Microsoft, or Mac OS, when the entire operating system comes from Apple, when you deal with Linux, the operating system comes from hundreds, thousands of different companies and people that have all contributed code for free to come together and form up an operating system. And because it's all free, anybody can change it. If Ronnie decided right now, oh, I'm gonna make my own Linux, he could. And then he could brand it with his name. It could be called Ronix, right? <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> maybe not the- Oh, that's uh, terrible. Not a great <laughs> ring to it, but uh, um, we, we'll work on it. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> but he could create Ronix, right? And then he could push it out and people could download it and install it and run it and be like, ah, I just upgraded to Ronix 2.0, it's awesome. He could do that because it's free. It's free, it's open source. Anybody can run it. It does make it a little difficult to film episodes like these, right. though, because I, I want to show you Linux. But Linux takes so many different forms. Uh, a company or a website called DistroWatch put together what they call the Linux family tree a few years ago, where they map out all the different Linux distributions that are available, where people have packaged the Linux kernel with other systems to, to make an operating system. And let me just show you. Um, it is a, a massive diagram. I'll see if I can uh, maybe uh, get this one higher res. But uh, once it loads, it is literally thousands of different versions. And I know it looks like it's loading really tiny, but the picture is really, really big. Uh, but basically, there are thousands of Linux distributions that are out there. And they started with one or two original distributions. And from there, they have grown. Oh, there we go. Now it's loading. Uh, they have grown to expand out into all of these little uh, derivative works, right? So when I say the Linux operating system, maybe you're running one of these core versions. This uh, one right here is Slackware. But you'll see where other people have taken Slackware and then they modify it. They change it. Maybe they add some more tools into it or, or change some defaults or whatever. And you end up with, Century Firewall, or Playmo Linux, or Vector Linux, Freepia, Slacks. Uh, I've never heard of these, right? And I use Linux every single day. I've been using Linux for 20 years. I've never heard of half of these. Right? Probably more than half of these I've never heard of, because a lot of them are very small, purpose-built projects. But in the Linux world, there are a handful of distributions that are very, very popular, that are considered core, that a lot of people run. So for example, here's Fedora Linux. I run Fedora Linux on my own personal machine. In the workplace, I run Red Hat Linux, which is right here. And you'll see where Red Hat has forked and, and been given numerous names from other companies that have used it to create their own Linux. But the most popular one is a distribution called Deb I'm sorry, Ubuntu. Ubuntu Linux is probably the most popular Linux distribution that's out there. And it's actually a derivative itself. It's built off of a distribution called Debian, which is the one I was about to say a moment ago. Um, oh, the image is still loading. It is a massive image. But you can see Ubuntu right here and see all the lines coming off of it as it branches out into all the derivative works. That's because Ubuntu is such an incredibly popular distribution. And that's probably the one, if you're, if you're just getting started with Linux, if you have never used it before and you want to experiment with it, Ubuntu is probably the best one as far as being the most stable and user-friendly and easy to implement. Now, I'll tell you in a business sense, I never use Ubuntu. In a business sense, I typically rely on more stable versions of Linux like Red Hat. Red Hat is probably the most stable and it's commercially supported. Ubuntu is a little more cutting edge and as a result, it's a little less stable. Well, on a workstation, I'm okay with that, right? If my workstation crashes, that's not a big deal. I, I don't, I just reboot, you're fine, right? But on a server, I can have thousands of customers on that server. If it reboots, that's bad. I want stability there. And we have that choice. It's not like Windows or Mac OS where you just get this one OS, that's what you've got to go with. In the Linux world, you can pick and choose. And I can say, hey, on my workstation at home, I'm, I'm going to run Fedora because I want something that's cutting edge. Or I'm going to run Ubuntu because I want something that's cutting edge. But on my servers, I want Red Hat 
because it's more stable. And, and if something goes wrong, there is actually a company behind Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I can sign up for commercial support, not free. I've got to pay for that. But if something goes wrong, I can pick up the phone and I can call them and I can ask for help. But if you think about it, like Microsoft Windows, it's the most popular operating system in the world. Ronnie, have you ever called Microsoft for help? I have called Microsoft for help. And what was that experience like? Uh, it was nightmarish, to say the <laughs> least. Uh, you are waiting and waiting and waiting. And sometimes it's, it's the call where you get to that point and they're like, oh, we'll just have to call you back. And they'll tell you a time period that they may call you back may. in. May. Or it may be after or it may be way before, but you never can really guess. Yeah. yeah. And, and even if you pay for Windows, they still charge you for support right. when you call, right? So it's not like you're getting free support from Microsoft Windows. So it is a very challenging environment. It's not very friendly. Well, you end up supporting yourself. And if you're used to that, if you're used to supporting yourself, you can run Linux absolutely free. It doesn't cost you a dime. And in fact, with Linux, they're more willing to support older hardware too because they don't make money off of hardware sales. So they don't care if you're using a laptop that came out this year or a laptop that came out 10 years ago. You can load a Linux distribution on there and it'll typically run really, really well, even on low hardware. All right, now, as I describe this, some of you are probably thinking, all right, with Microsoft, they are a multi-billion dollar company. They have hundreds of thousands of employees. Obviously, they're gonna create a great rock solid product. Apple, they're a multi-billion dollar company with hundreds of thousands of employees and they create a rock solid product that everybody knows and familiar with. Linux, on the other hand, is pretty much cobbled together by hobbyists and amateurs and, and people that aren't being directly paid to develop for it. So it's probably not as good, right? Well, you'd be really surprised. Universities have, have largely lent, uh, latched on to Linux as a great way to learn and teach. And so you have a lot of students, a lot of people who ultimately will go and work for Microsoft or will go and work for Apple that are working in the Linux space and creating better hardware support and functionality so that we end up with a fully featured operating system that is easy to use, that is able to compete head for head against Windows and against Mac OS. So what I'm showing you on the screen here, this is a default install of Ubuntu Linux. Ubuntu Linux is made by a company called Canonical, and it's built off of Debian Linux, which is a, a, another free version. Ubuntu is free, Debian is free, Fedora is free. Most of the distros that I've talked about in this episode are free. Red Hat Enterprise Linux is not free. You have to buy that one, but most of the others are free. And then if you want support, you, you pay for support if you need it. But if I just want to throw Linux onto a desktop, I can. I Like here, I did Ubuntu, and I didn't, didn't have to pay for it. Now it's up and it's running, and I've got a graphical user interface. I've got tools and resources just like any other distro that I can use, uh, but it, it's just a bunch of things put together. So for example, the Linux kernel is running under the hood, deep down inside it. If I were to, uh, if I were to open up my terminal and do a uname a uh, in the background here, I can see this is running Linux for Ubuntu 4.15. So this is the Linux kernel. And right there I can see it's saying GNU slash Linux. That's what's running at the heart of this. But a kernel by itself is not enough. And so the people at Canonical took the Linux kernel and they put the GNOME user interface on top of it. This user interface is called GNOME, uh, G-N-O-M-E, GNOME. Uh, it's running the X Windows window manager so that when I run my applications, they're being displayed on screen in various windows and I can have multiple windows open. They, uh, they've added, like that terminal that I just opened, that's actually not part of the kernel, that's just a, a terminal called Bash. And so the Bash shell is, is running right here so that I can interact with the system and issue commands and so on. I didn't have to put all this together myself, Canonical did it for me. And so now I've got this consistent user environment. And if I have 100 laptops, I can put Ubuntu Linux on all 100 of them. They'll all look and function the same way. And you'll see that for the most part, the screen elements are aligned with Windows and Mac OS, that if you can use one OS, you can usually jump over and start to use the other one. So there's a lot of similarity and overlap in between the different uh, operating systems that are out there. Now, Don, with the idea here of all the different distros that you've shown uh, so far, does that mean that there's going to be a different user interface for everyone, or do they kind of just fall under GNOME as far as a general category? So GNOME is certainly the most popular, right? But there are other ones that are out there. In fact, um, if, you, if you go and download like uh, Ubuntu, right? So um, if we go to the Ubuntu webpage and we go to download it, 
Uh, I guess I could have saved some time and click that download link that is now gone. But uh, if I go to, to download it, when you download Ubuntu, the default is to have the GNOME interface. Well, if you go and download Fedora, it defaults to GNOME as well. And if you download several different distros, all default to the GNOME UI. So I can install Fedora or Ubuntu or Debian, and they all look the same, right? They are different under the hood. The, the people who put them together made different decisions on different things, like Ubuntu uses a different shell than Fedora does. But at first glance, the desktop does look the same. But there are other desktops out there when you go to download Ubuntu, sure, it defaults to GNOME, but you have other choices. And so when I download it, see here, it's telling me I can up to, or I can download the Ubuntu 18.04 LTS, or long-term support version. But over here, we've got CR alternative downloads. And if you take a look at the alternative downloads, they'll show you a number of different, oops, I thought I could just scroll down for it, but let me click over to it, uh, a number of alternative versions of Ubuntu many of which use different user interfaces. And uh, let's see, right here, pass, oop, it's, uh, shoot, they call them flavors, and here, let me just search for it, we'll find it, um, where they use uh, alternative user interfaces. So for example, there's the uh, uh, XFCE is a user interface that's very streamlined. There's KDE, there's, uh, oh here, LXDE, See this screen right here? I'm on www.ubuntu.com slash download slash flavors. Oh, <laughs> it's spelled European style. Nice. O-U-R. Anyhow, so uh, uh, so these are the different ones. If you don't like that GNOME interface, you can always put in a different one. In fact, the current version of GNOME is GNOME version 3. Some people really don't like it, and they <laughs> like GNOME version 2. So you'll see down here Ubuntu uh, Mate. Mate is actually GNOME 2. GNOME 2 that people continued to develop instead of moving over to GNOME 3. So you have that choice, you have that flexibility. You compare that to Windows or Mac OS where you don't. They've made that choice. You have this one interface, that's what you get. With Linux, it's all about choice. It's all about options. Now, that is a double-edged sword. On one hand, you have people like me, where I like that. I like having the choice that I can configure it however I want, and I can pick and choose the components and build the OS that's perfect for me. But I'm a technical user, right? I'm used to that. I've worked with Linux a long time. I know what I like, and, and I can do that, right? Your average end user doesn't want that, right? They want to browse the web. They, they want to just be able to get in and run their programs. They don't want to fidget about changing a user interface or tweaking performance or whatever. They don't want to worry about it, right? Apple's mantra of it just works, well, that's what a lot of people want. Or Microsoft, where Microsoft is worried not so much about giving you choice, but about making it where as many applications can run as possible, right? Each company has a different focus. Apple wants things to be easy. Microsoft wants to support as many applications as possible. Linux wants to give you the choice to design things the way that you want. It's different, and that's how people usually end up picking an operating system. So each of these user interfaces, though, are just that. They're just user interfaces. They might look different, but the functionality they provide is actually very similar. Um, Xubuntu uses the XFCE user interface, which is very, very streamlined. It doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles like crazy shadow effects and, and fade in and fade out when you launch a window. It's designed for performance. If you have low-end machines or you just don't want to waste resources like memory and processor on, on fancy graphics, XFCE is great for that. So you have that choice. You pick uh, based on, on your own needs. And you can even install more than one UI and switch in between them. That's, that's easy enough to do. You have that flexibility. And I'm, I'm showing all this with Ubuntu. Fedora is the same way. Uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, CentOS, Debian. They're, they're all the same way. They all have where you can snap on different user interfaces if you want, if you find one that you're really, really comfortable. All right, Don, in the same way that we access like the, the hard drive on the, the Windows and also the Mac OS, how do we do that here inside of Linux? All right, we have a, a file manager, and your file manager actually does vary based on which user interface you're in. So I'm in GNOME right now, so it just has the GNOME file manager. And so if I click on my file screen here, I can browse through, and this is a component of GNOME. If you're using other systems, then they might have a, a different file manager. This one, I, I believe the, the actual code name for it is Nautilus. So you'll hear people call it Nautilus. Um, there's another one called Thunar, T-H-U-N-A-R, uh, which is the default in XFCE and some of the other interfaces. But for the most part, they look the same and they look similar to what we've seen in other operating systems. I can navigate through my file system. I'm seeing my desktop, documents, downloads, music, right? And this is all stuff that's in my home folder. 
but I can also browse my, my regular file system and start to explore the hard drive. So I see computer right here, and I can browse through my, my hard drive and find resources and files. So you have simple file management, just like most distributions, right? However, in the Linux world, they typically use different file systems than in Windows or Mac OS. So in Windows, you have the NTFS, uh, the new technology file system. In Apple world, you have APFS, the Apple file system, or the older Mac OS extended file system, which is called HFS+. Well, neither of those work in Linux. They, I mean, there's ways to make them work, but those are commercially licensed software. They're not free. And so Linux distros typically do not include them because the Linux distributions are trying to maintain a level of, of freedom. So they use a different file system called EXT, or the extended file system, which is different than the Mac OS extended, so don't, don't confuse those. But they use EXT. There's actually a handful of other file systems that can be used in Linux because, again, it's, it's about choice. So there's, there's XFS, there is um, ZFS, there's a few other ones that are out there. They're not as popular. Uh, BTRFS, I guess, is, is becoming a little more popular. Uh, they're not as popular, but it's up to you. If you want to use them, you can. You can pick and choose. The default, though, for most Linux distributions is EXT. And EXT gives you the ability to, to store files and folders, what I'm looking at here. You can also do links and aliases. So it might look like you have a file, but it's actually pointing to a file somewhere else, like a shortcut. You have that functionality. You can do compression and encryption. That's all functionality built into EXT. Well, all of that is hidden from us, the end user, right? When, when we're in a graphical user interface, we don't see that. But it is actually being managed by the system. If I fire up my disks utility here, I can see that I've got a 275 gig disk, and that, if I look at it, this one is formatted ext4, right? So this one has the ext4 file system. It's been configured that way. They configured it for me. Uh, it, yeah, I just did a default install here, so that's what they chose. But there are other file systems that are available when you format a file system, and I'm, I'm not going to format this one because I'm running on it, but uh, when you format it, they actually let you choose from different file systems. And, uh, you know, as I say that, the GUI here is only showing me one. But from the, from the disk, you'll actually see where there's a ton of them that are supported. The cool thing about Linux is, like most operating systems, it's very powerful. And they give you access to all of that. In the GUI, we might not see it. Right? The, the GUI might have things kind of simplified, like I just saw there. When I went to format the disk, ext4 was really the only one that I could choose. There were other ones like Lux, which is just encrypted ext. Um, so you know you have different ones that are available there. But if I were to drop down to my terminal and, uh, uh, and go into the command line, which is where everything kind of started, we'll find that we have the ability to use uh, all sorts of stuff as far as uh, alternate file systems. And I just have to find them, and we will see here where it has support for ext2, 3, and 4. It's got uh, BFS, CRAMFS, you know, some of these different file systems that are available. And I can even install more. If I want ZFS and BTRFS, I can add those uh, and bring them in and start to make use of it. So that functionality is there if we need it. If we're a power user, we can get in there and get at it. But for most people, they're not, not really interested. Now, Don, what about the idea of applications? Uh, so is installing an application uh, the same way as we would see like in what we saw in Mac OS and in uh, Windows? All right, this is probably the biggest difference between Linux and the other distros. In, in Windows and in Mac OS, it's relatively easy to install software. In Linux, it's actually pretty difficult, it's really <laughs> difficult, because each distro handles applications a little bit different. So applications are installed one way under Fedora and a different way under Ubuntu and yet another way under Debian. It, it varies from distro to distro. Now, most oper uh, Linux operating systems provide some kind of application store. And I can see I've got one right here, Ubuntu software. And I can go into the store and I can download applications here. So if I want a graphics editor, I can come in and I can search for, oh, actually, here, I can just go to graphics and photography. And I can browse through and I can find like Blender, which is 3D rendering software. Uh, the GNU image manipulation program, GIMP, uh, which is like a Photoshop clone. I find these and I can just click and choose to install. They're free and it's done, right? But where I get a challenge is not every software package is available here. I might have to go and download it from a vendor. And when you download it from a vendor website, they may or may not support Linux. There's a lot of software companies out there that don't make Linux software. Maybe I love Microsoft Office. Well, they make Microsoft Office for Windows, and they make it for Mac OS. They don't make it for Linux. 
I don't have that choice. I can't get Microsoft Office. I can get a clone, something like uh, OpenOffice or uh, LibreOffice or one of those, uh, and I can install that. In fact, I, I probably have it by default, but let's, uh, let's come in here and just see what we've got under productivity. And there's LibreOffice right there. So I can take LibreOffice and, oh, it's already installed. So I, I have an Office clone, but it's not the same as actual Microsoft Office, which I may want or need. If that's true, if I have software that I absolutely need that's tied to an OS, Linux might not be a good choice for me. Or I might have to jump through hoops to get that third-party software running here. Remember that Linux started as an operating system for developers, not for regular people. And so sometimes when software is distributed, it's, it's distributed as source code, and you have to compile it. Well, if you're not a programmer, that is not an easy feat. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong and problems that can happen. And if you're a hobbyist or a tech enthusiast, it's kind of fun, right? You, you work around that. But if you're a regular end user, it is not fun. It is not a good experience. And that's why Linux has less than a 1% market share on user workstations across the entire world. It is just not a popular workstation OS. But let me tell you, when it comes to servers, that is a different story. In the server world, well, we want our servers to be as optimized as possible, to run as fast as they can. And Linux gives us the freedom to come in and eliminate all the software that we don't need and get it very, very small, very efficient. And because it's a free operating system, we can clone it over and over and over again to create a server farm as big as we want without incurring licensing fees. That's a big <laughs> deal. And that's why Linux does have a commanding market share in the server world. But remember, on a server, you don't see a graphical user interface like this, right? On, on a server, it boots up, and you see a black screen and a command prompt, and it sits there. Because you're supposed to enable some services and just let it run and not mess with the server again, right? That's how servers function. So it's a very different world when you get into servers, and that is the world where Linux performs the best. Now, what about the idea that we saw also in taking a look at what's running on the machine itself at that time? So in Windows, we take a look at the task manager in uh, Mac OS. We talk about the activity monitor. Is there something similar to that? There absolutely is. And, you know, Linux was the first multitasking operating system that I ever used. So I remember I got an email from a friend of mine. This would have been in 1992. Uh, and, and he told me, he said, Don, you've got to try this Slackware Linux. It was a, one of the early distributions. It's still around today. He said, you've got to try this. The multitasking on it will make you wet your pants. <laughs> and I, this is a quote. Uh, so, so. I tried it, and he was right. Like, it was amazing. You could run more than one application at the same time. In the DOS world of the time, you really couldn't do that very well. And even in Mac OS, it wasn't doing a great job of it. Multitasking operating systems have come a long way. Well, in the Unix world, multitasking was, was old hat. They've been doing it for a long time, so it made sense that Linux would have that functionality as well. And it did. So I can come in here, and I can, I can have my terminal open. I can launch a web browser. I can fire up LibreOffice. So I'm running all these different applications all side by side. And they show up here in my sidebar, so I can easily switch between them just through on-screen elements, or I can use like the uh, uh, Alt-Tab keyboard shortcut to switch in between them that way as well. So I've, I've got you know, the ease of, of moving around. There's an application in, in GNOME, so if you use a different interface, you might not have this, but in the GNOME interface, there is an application called the System Monitor. And if you fire up the System Monitor, it shows you the performance of your system and the applications that are running. So I can see all the programs, how much CPU they're using, how much memory they're consuming. And if I have a program that's gone crazy, like maybe Firefox goes crazy, that I might see it in here at 100% CPU, I can take it and I can terminate that program by stopping it or killing it. Stopping it kind of pauses it and sometimes you can uh, uh, retrieve your data in that case, or I can just outright kill it and that's gonna kill out Firefox and close it, and my system stays up and running and happy. That's kind of the nice part about having a multitasking operating system. So you can see all of that activity that's going on in your system and really get the most out of your computer. And this is very similar to the task manager and activity monitor from Windows and Mac OS. Now, Don, last thing here as we take a look, we've also talked about user accounts too. Can we set up user accounts inside of our Ubuntu setup? Absolutely. And, you know, Linux had user accounts before any of the other uh, operating systems. So Windows and Mac OS weren't designed as network operating systems from the ground up. They were designed as standalone systems. And then they added networking later on. Well, Linux was based upon Unix, which was a network operating system from very, very early on. So Linux has 
always been a network operating system. And a key component of being a network operating system is that you have more than one system, which means more than one user. So that user functionality is absolutely built in. And when you install Linux, it's actually going to create two user accounts for you. One user account is yours, a regular user that you can use to do things. And the second user account is a special one called root. And the root user is like a full administrative user. They can do whatever they want on the computer. And if it's just you using the computer, that's probably all you'll have, you and root. But if you're sharing the computer or if you're using it in a corporate environment, you'll want more than one user account. And if I go into my, my application list here and just type users, I'll find inside of the settings panel where there is a users panel and I can come in and I can create additional user accounts. Now, when I look at it right now, I just see myself and that's it. But that's because I'm logged in as a regular user. If I hit the unlock button here, it's going to ask me to authenticate as an administrator. And so I can provide my password. And now, not only do I see my account, but I've got a nice shiny add user button up here. And I can add more users. I can make them standard users or administrators. So maybe I want to create a user account for Ronnie. And so I'll come in here. I'll set his password. And so now when he comes to use this computer, he can sit down, log in as himself instead of logging in as me and have his own customized and personalized settings like we've seen with the other operating systems. This is kind of a key component of an operating system is the ability to give people that, uh, that experience of using their own environment. So now when I go to log in, I get to pick which user I'm going to log in as. I'll log in as Ronnie. And when he logs in, he'll see his own desktop which he might have the same applications as me, but he may have different documents on his desktop or a different wallpaper or whatever. Uh, and it's, it's going to go black for a second here while it's setting up his profile for the first time that he logs in. And then he's going to see that desktop any moment now. I said black, it's actually purple, I guess, once, yeah. the, once the GUI starts. So there we go. And it's treating him like a brand new user because he is. What's new in Ubuntu? Let's teach you about this system. And so you get a little bit of exposure here as it walks you through some of the, uh, the basic setup. And then he's in. And now we can start to use the system however it is that he chooses to use it. So the key thing here is that Linux, while it might be free, while it might be developed by a large number of hobbyists and enthusiasts, it is actually a very viable operating system. And in the server world, it's already one. In the workstation world, we'll see. You know, Each year, they seem to get a little stronger and a little stronger in their desktop presence. But there's usually some application or another that people say, I need this application and it doesn't run on Linux. And so that's kind of what kills it and holds it back. Uh, the video gaming industry is like that, where most video games don't run on Linux. And so video games, oddly enough, drive technology development. And so that kind of holds Linux back. But we're seeing a lot of that change. And who knows, maybe when we film the same show 10 years from now, we'll be talking about Linux as the, the primary workstation OS. Just time will tell. All right, Don. Well, thank you again for helping us to, to get a little bit more familiar with GNU Linux. It's a great topic, something that we should also consider. Uh, as we sign off, Don, last words here. All right, all of these operating systems are are you know fairly similar in the functionality they provide. If you're going to be an IT worker, I encourage you to learn a little bit about all three of them. If you have Windows on your own machine, you've kind of knocked out one OS, or if you have Mac OS on your own machine, you've got that. Uh, if you want to experiment with the others, though, you'll probably want to learn a little bit about virtualization. Programs like VirtualBox or VMware uh, Workstation, VMware Fusion, those programs, they let you run other operating systems in a virtual machine. So you can quickly switch between them and practice and learn without messing up your underlying operating system. Check that out. Check out virtualization technology because it's a great way to learn OSs and experiment even if you're, you're not quite sure. And Linux, Linux is a steep learning curve. It's a hard one to jump in and learn. So you don't want to just format your machine and go Linux on day one. You want to kind of dip your toes in the water and virtualization lets you do that. So definitely check it out if you want to learn more. All right. Uh, thank you again, uh, Don, for helping us there with those last good pieces of advice. And thank you also for watching. Signing off for IT Pro TV, I'm your host, Ronnie Wong. And I'm Don Pazette. Stay tuned right here for more of the CompTIA IT Fundamentals shows coming your way. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.